call the meeting to order. Um, I'm going to start right away. I don't see it on here, but before we even do approval agenda, we're going to say welcome to Paul. Um, so good Paul morning, everybody. Our new committee member. So morning. Uh, if we want to go around, we can each uh, say our name and introduce ourselves. So my name is Nicole Vieswick. I'm the chair of the committee. Okay. Oh, you got to hit the button. Oh, press the button. Yeah. Good morning, Paul. Good. My name is Sandy Foss at Kovacs hyphenated. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm a volunteer committee handicap all over. Okay. I'm Mary Todman. I'm Mary. I think we met a bit earlier. Okay. Mark Bateman. Hart. Yep. And then those people online, you can each take a turn to say hi. My name's Linda Granger. Hi, Linda. Thank you. Morning. My name's Heather Ratz, and I'm the CEO of the Brighton Public Library. Hi, Heather. Good morning. Hi, I'm Colleen McPeak. Hi, Colleen. <laughs> and I'm Tom. Um, yeah, uh, good Deputy morning. Kirk. Nice to meet you. All right. So, yes, we're very happy to have you join Thank us. You. Thank you. Um, so, on our agenda is approval of the agenda that we have here today. Is there anything else that's missing or anything else that people wanted to add? One thing, Ms. Chair, um, the report from um, the Public Works Division, uh, we just, we're gonna need to move it. Um, the director is showing up at 1030. So I don't know, I think we should just maybe if we, if you don't mind, we can just leave it as like a floating item until okay. until the time is right yep that's okay fine. cool any other additions or changes to the agenda mark just under the 7.2 the sidewalk work update uh, preston's not here it might be for the committee if we follow up because the sidewalk that was done there last year there's still two sections that need to be repaired from the work that they did do for somebody put the big footprints into it that are still trip hazards. Can we add that for whenever the director of public works comes sure. and add yep. that to that discussion? I know they said they were going to get to it. I just don't want to see them miss because they, they go down two or three inches. They were aware of them last year at the end, but, and they're right near where they put those community mailboxes where you can pick up flyers. And when they get filled with dirt and leaves, you can't see them. Okay. All right. Are we all right to go ahead and approve the agenda then? Mary's got her hand up. Sandy seconded. All in favor? Aye. All righty. Um, so we've got our agenda. Any declarations of pecuniary interests or general nature thereof for today's meeting? Okay. Um, and attached to our minutes from our last meeting, which was June 11th. Um, not sure if everyone's had a chance to look it over to see if there was anything that was missing on it or needs to be adjusted. Mary? Um. I just it just reminded again. Did that uh, basket get delivered to Ralph? It's on my to do list. It's going to be delivered this afternoon. Oh, perfect. Everyone's still looking at it. Or are we okay to move on? Anyone want to motion that to approve the minutes? Mary, okay. 
Sandy seconded, all right. All righty. Um, we don't have any delegations that I know of today for our meeting, so we'll carry on. We're going to skip over 6.1 for right now, just so um, um, we'll wait for the Director of Public Works to come. So we'll move to 6.2, which is municipal update. Um, so that's from Tom. All right. We got a few things to update uh, the committee on. Um, well, the first thing, actually, I got some great news. Yes, just yesterday. Um, remember the the grant that we applied for last year? They ended up opening uh, more funding for it, and we were approved. Awesome. Yeah. So um, originally, that was written for uh, three doorways in this building. Um, one of which has now been already repaired when they were doing the uh, security upgrades. Um, so I was actually talking to the manager of operations about um, they've been planning to add uh, some improvements to access at the YMCA building on Main Street there. And um, so we are going to try to allocate the funds for one of those doors to that building for, for that purpose. So um, so we're kind of adding, spreading the accessibility out a little bit with that too. So that was, that was kind of a nice, uh, a nice surprise to get that a year after submitting. <laughs> um, I believe it was for approximately 17,000. Yep. Um, and on, further to that, they're actually going to be following up with me in September to like, you know, secure the next steps and all that kind of thing. So I imagine we'll, we'll probably be looking to, to get those improvements done uh, in the fall. Um, okay, so I've got another point. I know we talked about this already before, but um, live captioning of meetings. Sorry, I just had to mute you, Colleen, but if, so if you need to speak, you'll just have to hit unmute. Um, so the live captioning, um, after further research and trials of using the system that I had originally identified, um, there's not, you know, um, you know, it's not adding like a half an hour to the setup or every time or anything, but it, it adds uh, like uh, quite a bit to the procedure um, of setting up meetings because there's actually like you have to now stream it to um, three different sources instead of just one like right now we go through zoom and then we stream to youtube um, zoom only allows one streaming source out so in order to have also a live streamed caption you have to do this whole like work around which is kind of complex. Um, so my concern with that was for on the staff side of things, like, you know, for writing a procedure and that, you know, just adding a whole bunch of extra steps into the processes is just one small risk of, of a situation. So it was something to consider. Um, so I started looking further um, into other options. And there's, uh, there's actually one other option that's fully human live captioning, um, much more expensive, um, but hundred percent accurate. Um, so there's a service in Canada. Um, now, unfortunately it's, it's like $110 an hour, um, versus it would have been, or using like a, the AI version, like the artificial intelligence version program. Um, we're looking at probably about 60, between 60 and $80 a month um, versus possibly a thousand with a, with a live captioning person. Um, but I just wanted to present that information to you guys uh, because this will be going to council as a report to get their decision on it. Um, and I thought, you know, just it would be nice to, if you guys had a, uh, any more feedback on that before I, before I do that. So, 
again, it's you're kind of weighing two options with the artificial intelligence, um, more work on staff end, a little bit more room for error on the actual setup for each meeting. And um, 80 percent accuracy is what they uh, sort of guarantee, which does leave some room for some flubs for sure, especially in like a Zoom type meeting. Um, and then the pros and cons on the live side um, or the live human captioning side is, you know, 100% accuracy, um, ease of use for uh, the public. Um, so they can actually have it in like a pop-up screen where they can see the entire transcript or they can choose to just view it on, this, on the screen in YouTube where it's just like it pops up per line when someone's speaking. So there's a little bit more user friendliness to that, um, but the cost is very significant. So I think if we were going to do something like go the route of a live captioning person service, um, my suggestion would be that if we went that way only for council meetings to do that, and then for committee meetings, go the route of the artificial intelligence side. To, to maybe save a little bit of money <laughs> if that was the intention, because then we otherwise we'd be looking at, you know, three, four thousand dollars a month kind of thing. I think my only thought, well, I had two thoughts. <clears throat> if you're already setting it up using the AI for other committee meetings, then staff are already trained to be able to do it for council meetings. That's when I thought about doing like a hybrid version of the both together. Um, and is my only other thought was, is Zoom the only option for, for doing meetings? Like if you switch to, because um, I know at work we use um, Teams, Microsoft Teams versus, you know, Google Meets or all those other ones is the automatic captioning easier on those platforms versus Zoom. It, it ends up like, to your point, I, I looked into that for Teams because we have Microsoft 365 as part of um, the municipality um, infrastructure. So, but it seemed to me from what I was reading, it's the same situation where it streams one channel out. Um, so it sort of adds that complexity no matter what. Um, and yeah, like, again, to, to your point there, like, the um, the artificial intelligence side, I don't think it's it's a huge barrier to staff to to train them on how to do it. It's just the that it is that extra work for the lower uh, potential percentage of of accuracy. So that was the more that was it was really that piece that I really wanted to see what you guys feel how you feel about that. Thank you. Uh, first of all and foremost, we want accuracy. 80% um, isn't good enough, especially uh, council decisions. Uh, we saw that before how ridiculous some of the comments were that came before. Nothing against you, Tom. It just didn't work well. I wasn't typing it. <laughs> yeah. So um, if it's not guaranteed 100%, I don't even want to touch it. And the other thing is that I think uh, presented to council that that should be a part of the budget if if people are really, and I'm sure they are on council, interested that uh, people with accessibility issues should be granted that kind of money spent for something that they that will help their lives. So. We spend a lot of money on some pretty stupid things. I mean, I'm sorry to say, but that to me is very important. So you were talking 3000 a month. That's not an awful lot considering some of the stuff that ends up being passed. So, um, so 36,000 a year? Well, I, maximum. Um, I think it would depend if you wanted to approach it with that strategy of, um, 
only council meetings. If it was, if we we're only council meetings, we're probably looking at around a thousand a month. Um, if we added the streamed committee meetings, I think we'd be closer to that three thousand dollar mark. I mean, some of those meetings can be quick, quite short sometimes, so it's not a huge deal. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a minimum one hour charge as well on that. Um, so, and one other piece I just wanted to add is, or I guess sort of two points on this. We have never received thus far a request for live captioning from, from the, our citizens. So that's one piece. Um, but the other one is currently, it's not a requirement to have live captions uh, of stream meetings but I suspect it's going to come in to play soon. In the States right now, across the board, government, all government levels, it's a requirement. So that's something to, to think about too, right? If we're gonna go that route, <clears throat> so I'm just making so I can see Mark too while we're talking. Um, if we're gonna go that route, it's sort of thinking ahead too, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I would agree with uh, Mary, certainly uh, quality of, of streaming is, is paramount, I would think, uh, especially for any uh, public related meetings, be they committee or be they council meetings. Um, we have a reputation to, <laughs> to uphold that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the town of Brighton needs access to its, to its uh, constituents. Um, so certainly, if we look at it as an investment, you're investing in the capability of access by constituents to, um, to this municipality. I, I think that's an important uh, concept to, to get over that. I guess the next question is, can the, can the accuracy be improved upon? I'm thinking that this is a it, it's voice activated captioning because people are talking, so it recognize it's it's voice it's a, a voice recognition, right? Is there any way to improve the accuracy of that? Yep, you're right. By, through through um, through computerization and and that kind of thing when you're when because you're pro you're going to have to program it to recognize certain words, certain voices and things like that, I would imagine at some point, or if it's already, if, if it's intuitive, that's fine, uh, but it's not, it's only intuitive 80% of the time, then I don't know, even know why it's on the market. Um, I think through the chair. Um, so to, on your last point there, um, primarily the, that artificial intelligence uh, products are used for internal meetings is what I'm seeing. So that's why the accuracy isn't as important or, or situations where the accuracy isn't crucial sort of thing, right? Um, but um, so it isn't really necessarily configured by us. Like it's, it's their standalone pro products that we would, we would license. Um, but there is some changes that we can make in the back end, like name recognition. So if we, we provide certain names that are going to be at the meeting, it will try to match those names when someone speaks somebody's name sort of thing. So that's one area where it could be improvement. You also can put like a lexicon in. Uh, so certain keywords that like the committee would, would be discussing that could present problems. Um, you, can, you can add those into the sort of register of words. Um, but all, so the, you know, that could improve certain things, but all in all, they're still only guaranteeing 80% accuracy. So it's, I, I, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And it's also the nature of the, the, the format too, right. Where, um, someone jumps in and someone gets cut off or their audio is not working properly. There's a lot of room for error in, in there. So, um, I think uh, Councillor Bateman can also um, attest to this. Uh, 
it got so ridiculous that even our names were, it was like, the, it, it was mocking the names, like the mayor, I can't even remember what he was called now, but, and I got distracted because I thought, this is so bizarre, what's going on here? So I don't even wanna to touch something that's 80% accurate. Uh, pay the, pay, you know, you get really what you pay for. And uh, uh, this isn't a lot of money, you know, in the scheme of things. And if and you said nobody's asked for it yet, but maybe people don't even know that it exists. Mm -hmm. And maybe there are people out there that, and if it's only one person, I don't care. If that really helps that person, then we should go for it. And I think council would see the value in that. I was just going to add to what Tom was saying. It, I, there's no perfect system because the ones I've looked at, Microsoft Teams is built in. I don't know if Zoom is built in. I think on the user end, everybody can activate that now. But part of the problem of no matter what system you get, and when I was looking around the room, there was two mics on when one person was talking, and that will cause trouble with the closed captioning. Because if your mic was on and you did this, when you're watching Zoom, if you're closer to the mic, it switches to that. And when you watch and listen to people speak, it's the pace of their speech and the words that they put in there, because if you just listen and everybody does it, you'll hear, um, mm, because it's just human nature and it's picking that up and you can't put all the words in there for the names like you had mentioned, Tom, you could input press and park and it'll recognize names for meetings. But when you start saying a and um and huh, and everybody does it, that's where no matter what system you put in, it's not going to recognize those names and then extra mics on and the noise in and around. Even that noise we were hearing earlier, if somebody's mic was on, it might pick up that first and then it just starts making up words for it. So it's, it's, it'll be difficult to get a perfect, perfect system. Just wanted to know who, whose budget does this come out of? This would likely come out of the clerk's office budget, I would think, but um, it's uh, a municipal factor. Like it wouldn't be coming out of the accessibility advisory committee. Um, sorry, I had one more thought too on when you guys were talking kind of triggered something um, that even though no one has requested it. And like you said, you know, people just might don't know it's available sort of thing. Um, the, a lot of reports say that even, even people without, um, you know, hearing issues and things actually appreciate the live captioning like that, like, you know, a lot of viewers will still just pull it up um, just so they can follow along more easily in the meeting. Because uh, then you can go back, you can say, what did they say there? And you can like scroll back and, and you know, that kind of thing. Like, so I think, I think it's, it's a really great tool. It's, just, it's, it's about, it's about the, uh, the cost of the live person um, is the main thing. So if, if there was a recommendation from this group to support that approach, uh, I think it would help uh, taking that to council. Does anyone online have any comments or thoughts on it? Okay, don't hear anything. I know for my end professionally, it's interesting how you know, I, I recommend writing aids a lot. And so Dragon, naturally speaking, was the first option. And now pretty much all platforms have voice to text, but it's still more efficient typing than voice to text because there's so many errors on voice to text that you have to go back and fix them all that it takes just as much time typing out something as it does dictating it. So yeah, that's where that difficulty with the, um, and that's without other distractions and without other people talking over top. So um, I, I think it's a great idea. Is the committee in favor of putting a um, recommendation in or a motion into council? Um, and it sounds like everyone is favoring for especially council meetings, the, the live captioning version or the in-person version, I guess we should call it. Is everyone in agreement with that, Mary? I definitely am. If, and I wouldn't mind putting a resolution forward. I'm sure somebody here will second that motion. Um, and 
I think Tom will be able to present it well enough uh, with our recommendation that maybe council will decide just for council meetings, but who knows? But for now, I think at least the council meetings. So uh, do you have a suggestion, Tom? Because you're the one that's done all the research on this. Would you like the resolution to read for council and all boards and committees or to start with council? Or leave it totally up to council to make that decision? Yeah, we could leave it open and just say live streamed meetings. Yeah. And then when we discuss it in the report, it can sort of be maybe option A or option B. That's more for council, right? But if right. you guys support um, utilizing a live human captioning service for live streamed meetings, mm -hmm. then I think, I think that's a good push from you guys to say, that's the, the, the big goal. Yeah. And then council can decide from there. Right. So you'd have say in after the, the main meat of the resolution, you'd have these options. Good idea. Yeah. Sure. You got the words? I'll, I'll move it. Um, just a second. Mark's got his hand up uh, there. Just a question the the pricing that's for live stream real time captioning, or is there a price for after a meeting takes place? It's transcribed. I was just wondering, like, when you look at, say, the council meetings and you look at the number of people viewing a regular council meeting, you might have three people viewing. But if you go in a week later, you'll see that, say, 50 or 70 have. So we might want to look at how many are watching real time and how many are watching after the fact. You can both still you can still pursue captioning, but when it gets to council, they might want to know how many are watching real time versus how many are watching after. And there might be a difference in the pricing that someone takes the meeting, transcribes it, and then it is 100% accurate. Yeah, that's a good point through the chair. Um, so there was, in, in my original discussion here, we talked about that part too. So there's the, uh, the live artificial intelligence and then those same services offer where you can upload a video of the meeting after following the meeting. So like the next morning or whatever, they give a 24 hour turnaround. Um, and it's significantly less. I think it's a dollar 25 a minute um, for, and it is a human actually doing a, a transcript of the meeting. Then they would uh, then provide the meeting back to you with the, with the transcript uploaded. And then you would have to like re-upload it to YouTube, basically. So that is another option. That's obviously significantly less. Then you're talking maybe um, maybe $180 a meeting um, as opposed to um, 300 and something. <laughs> I think Mark's suggestion is good, but we could put that as another option then mm -hmm. and let council decide then if that's what everybody agrees to. So does it make sense that our motion will say that we recommend for um, captioning of council meetings especially, and here are the three different options. Does that make sense? Or should we say more live person? I, I wonder if we should be more specific. I wonder if we should say live human. Cause I think the feeling I'm getting is no to artificial intelligence is right. So if we say live human, that could either be uh, after the fact transcript, like the following day or live in during the meeting. So maybe not live. Maybe we'll just say council utilized a human captioning service. Um, and then that way it could either be live or the next day. And then, but then in both of those scenarios, you're getting uh, 99 to 100% accuracy. Have you got that typed out there? So I saw you typing. Yeah. The, what have you got uh, written out? So I've got that the committee recommend council utilize a human captioning service for live stream meetings. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. And I think Mary was going to move it. Secondary. 
I think that'll, I just want to say, I think that'll work because if you don't go with one option, you go with the other. Because if you look right now, you should be able to see how many people are viewing live right now if we're on YouTube. Can you see? Because my point is like, you might only have one, maybe none, but in two weeks, because we're having this meeting at 10 o'clock. So it's pretty presumptuous that everybody stopped what they're doing to watch the accessibility. It doesn't mean they're not interested. They're going to watch it when they can have time. So if we don't go for the one option, it's nice to have that other because there is going to be people that view the meetings. They just may not view them when they're happening because you know it's called life <laughs> and they might have other things to do at the time. So to have that ability to do it so that people can view it on their terms and their time would be perfect. Even council meetings, we've had them go till 11 o'clock at night. Nobody's staying up at 11 o'clock at night to listen to us. <laughs> And to your question, there is no one watching right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we'll go ahead to motion as seconder for the motion. Sandy? Um, and all in favor? All right. So that's been passed. Um, are there any other municipal updates or do we want to pass it over to Preston? Um, Oh, I had one other thing um, just to touch on. Uh, this is more of like a, a look ahead type thing. We're, we're currently, um, well, we've actually completed a review of requests for proposals for a uh, electronic voting system for the election, the 2022 election. Um, and so I just wanted to get, maybe get the committee start to think about um, features of accessibility they would want to see in the 2022 municipal election. So we don't necessarily have to discuss it at this time. We, I could just add it as a, a regular item on maybe the next agenda, but just kind of like get the, get the wheel spinning a little bit so we can, um, because we'll be doing negotiations with the su successful uh, proponent in the fall. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, so we'll pass it over to Preston. We have down that uh, sidewalk report and discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I, I've had our GIS coordinator prepare a, a basic map of what we've done and what we plan to do as part of the accessibility needs that we have to accomplish in the next uh, three years. Uh, Tom, I emailed a scan of this to you so you could maybe bring it up to show the people online and then I'll just hand this map out and then we can just discuss it. Oh, sorry, just one second here. I got to drag it over there. Well, we have a quick break here. Heather, I brought snacks or you can't join us. I could be upstairs pretty quick. Uh, no, that's okay. I, I'll just follow along up there. Thanks, President. Can everyone see that in the Zoom meeting? All I'm seeing is your desktop blue screen. Okay. Um, okay, sorry. Technical issue here. Give me a second. <laughs> so you're seeing it now, right? Yes, that's better. Okay. Are you guys okay looking at the paper copies uh, in the Zoom? Okay. Then we have everyone covered. <laughs> okay. So on this map, there's a legend, and uh, are they able to view yours, Tom? Are they seeing the same screen? They're seeing the screen. It's on my desktop. I've got two. Oh, okay. So they're so seeing it here. Then? Yeah. Okay. So everybody might not be able to see the legend at the bottom, but uh, it includes tactical plates, which are the green dots and red dots. And then there's some linear lines of uh, red that has been completed in 2020. Green, which is going to be completed in 2021 this year as part of this existing contract. Uh, yellow are the proposed works for 2022, and then blue is proposed works for 2023. 
Um, now, some things will change depending on larger capital construction projects, but this generally encapsulates um, what our plans are for the next uh, three construction seasons. And um, I know this committee was concerned about John Street and the tactical plates at the buttons where John meets Elizabeth out by Tim Hortons and No Frills. They've been poured, they've been uh, placed already, they're done, except the, the asphalt needs to be completed around them to finish them off. And then the plan to get a bit of a walking space um, from John Street to that first entrance just south of the gas station. We're gonna pave as much as we can of that existing grass shoulder. And then I'm gonna paint a white line to try to delineate a pedestrian area uh, along that side. It's about the best we can do with the design of that road. So at least it gets people into the first entrance of the parking lot so that they can kind of disperse from whichever um, venue they wanna to go to there, whether it be the gas station, Tim Hortons or no frills. So I guess if there's any other concerns or questions, regarding the program or what we plan on doing. I was just gonna say Sanford Street is awesome. <laughs> Getting that all fixed up. And, uh, and I'm impressed that they're actually going around and doing all those, um, the, um, the tactile plates and even doing the opposite side of the sidewalk and clearing that. Like I was seeing that happening up on, um, oh, I don't know the name of that street up there. Um, but um, just around Orchard Crescent there, I, I noticed that they were putting those tactile plates and actually going across the street where okay. you would cross and You're doing up. it on the other side as well. So yeah, so, no, I think, yes. and, and I think I've seen um, comments just online about people being happy um, with, with um, how that part is going. I do know last, I think last meeting we had discussed a bit about um, pavement being uneven, like getting onto sidewalk plates. Like at Lola's, there's a spot there that there's quite a difference between the pavement and the sidewalk. And I think between Rexall and Sobeys as well, I think there was discussion about that being quite uneven. Yes, through you, Madam Chair. Um, there are a few spots that have sunken since the repairs two years ago. So they're on our asphalt contract to grind that corner out and then repave it so that it's a better transition point. Um, the Kingsley Street has both sides that have issues and as well as the northwest quadrant of the Rexall and Sobeys intersection is, is really bad. So the, the, a lot of those spots are identified in our asphalt contract, which was just awarded uh, last week. So hopefully it's in the next month or so. I would like to ask the question. Go ahead, Linda. Okay, I saw that down at the bottom of the map that you were going to continue to, to put the sidewalk along Harbor Street. Is it gonna be wavy like the other part of the sidewalk? And there is a, a, a place on uh, Harbor that the sidewalk has pitched up at house uh, number 38 and I uh, ha have requested for that to be fixed. And the big thing about going along Harbor Street now, I was along last week, was somehow those metal pieces over the runoff have been moved so they don't all look safe where they are. Could you have a look at those? Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, Linda, that section you referred to with the bumped up piece, we have identified for next year to get that section repaired. And uh, we check those uh, plates about every month in the summertime. Uh, sometimes in the wintertime, the sidewalk plow will knock them or jar them loose, but uh, we check those regularly so that they're in the safe location to, to support the load that's supposed to be going over them. Uh, the other issue we have with those is well, initially it's a poor design um, and should have never been built, but uh, apparently garbage trucks and recycling trucks frequent that sidewalk down there and that causes them to get bent at times. So uh, quite frequently we have to flatten them back out as well, but they are checked quite regularly just to make sure they're in a proper location. Thank you. Is the design able to be changed? 
next year or will it be the same up and down? We're currently designing a tender to reconstruct and redesign all of Harbor Street. And so it'll go from a sidewalk to some sort of multi-use path at that time when it's reconstructed. So um, we're gonna design the entire road right from the marina down at the Preskill Parkway all the way through to County Road 64 and Prince Edward Street. So uh, the idea would be to make that a, a connecting link to the park with a multi-use pedestrian pathway, pathway, which will probably be some sort of paved surface. Um, and then that'll eliminate and get rid of all this sidewalk and there'll be stormwater improvements to help drain the area a bit better. Um, and it'll likely be broken up into three phases just due to the cost of construction. Uh, so the first section might be from Cedar Street to Mills Road, because that's where the greatest concern is for stormwater in the area. And then the other sections will be done as, as budget is available. Any other comments or questions? Mary? Preston, I always wondered uh, how come uh, when the plates are set in that they're not to um, whatever you do, sandblast and whatever, so they don't bleed into the cement because it ends up looking really quite ugly after a few years. Um, through you, Madam Chair, we looked at that and it's extremely expensive to get them sandblasted and refinished uh, because every time we bend them, that finish is going to crack off so it won't last. So it's just, a, they, they do look kind of ugly, but at least they're safe and secure. And then when we get it fixed up properly, they'll be completely gone. Um, and then the other uh, issue we'll have to look at, we have those same plates on Elizabeth Street. We have the same problem there. So that's something that we'll have to get engineered and, and get rid of them so that it properly drains and we don't have this plate that's always creating issues for people. Excuse me, I'd like to speak again, please. Yeah, go ahead, Linda. Okay, the crossing at... Uh, Terry Fox on the south side to push the button to come north. It's um, taped together, which was look kind of ugly there. I hope you're going to be able to fix that. And the two buttons on the north side of Terry Fox to, and this is at Elizabeth Street, I should have said that. Um, they are just holes that you poke your finger in and hope that the signal is going to work with the little bit you can push because the, the button that was over covered them have disappeared. I don't know how that happened, but uh, it was pretty alarming to see that the, um, the fixture there was taped together. I don't know if there was an accident there or what, but um, I hope, I'm hoping that that's going to be fixed properly. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, uh, actually just yesterday we discussed that intersection because I noticed the button tops are missing and uh, the contractor that we have on, on call for that is going to be called probably already uh, to get the taped up uh, button replaced and as well as the other buttons repaired. Uh, yeah, somebody somebody either hit the, that stand that's on the south west side or maybe the ambitious youth just broke it loose but it was broken loose we had to fix it and and taping that button on was the only solution we had at the time until we can get the whole casing replaced so it will be repaired thank you Andy yes I just I don't know if this is um, appropriate right now we live in Ontario Street, and um, you, you're you also in charge of the gutters, digging out the gutters, or can I talk to you about this at a different time? Yeah, the ditches. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the ditches were dredged out because we were all clogged up, and, and if we have a flow of water, it's not going to go into the creek there. So they, they dredged them out, but they dredged them too deep, and they threw in some um, grass seed but we had a drought for a month so the grass seed is good, a good deal of weeds but for somebody who's 79 to try and cut down in there it's not a good move it's just too deep so i wondered if anything was going to be done about that or nobody else has mentioned it or 
is there is there a, a legal depth? And through you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, they ditched those out to the proper elevation based on the invert of the culverts. And it, it is unfortunate because it is an urbanized area that has an open ditch, but to fix anything is gonna be really costly. So it'll be done typically when things are reconstructed. Uh, they'd go to, to a storm drain through there and, and get rid of the open ditches and put in curbs and that sort of thing. But uh, given the other needs in the, the area for the municipality, it could be quite some time before Ontario Street gets reconstructed to, to eliminate the ditches on the... Okay, so the next question then is, how do we take care of that as private owners? Um, well, I guess technically you don't have to take care of that. It can just be left to grow, which, which happens in a few spots down through there, and then we add it to our roadside grass okay. cutting. Um, yeah, it is, it's one of those awkward situations where it's a difficult piece of infrastructure to maintain and and uh, it's just generally the area that it's in is, is urbanized with an open ditch, which is never a good thing because people always want to maintain their frontage along every home. So it becomes yeah. a difficult maintenance it's issue. Very, very difficult right now. I mean, we're getting up there and, and trying to get a lawnmower and trying to do a work. Excuse me. Could people in the council room speak a little louder so I can hear them, please? Sorry, Linda. We're talking about the ditch in front of my house that's been dug out and it's too deep to maintain. So I was just talking to Preston about it for a minute, but I I'm finished. I got my answers. Thank you. Mark? Uh, just a question on one section of the sidewalk on Prince Edward Street, uh, Preston. The sidewalk's good all the way down. They've redone both sets of tracks that section in between the tracks is that our responsibility or the train because it's all it's really not a sidewalk anymore all broken up the amount of people walking i don't know if they have plans to fix it or us uh, through you madam chair the areas of the tracks it's, it's hard to get a direct message or, or answer from cn or cp um, they tell us that it's our responsibility to maintain but when we want to do something they make it almost impossible to maintain so they're, they're undergoing design work and uh, reconstruction of that crossing to increase pedestrian safety. Uh, CN and CP are working with the county to make that happen because there's some road work to be done as well. But there, uh, there was a design floated around quite a while ago um, where they're actually gonna have gates or they're proposing gates on the pedestrian walk through there so that the gate comes down and right. walk through. Um, so that will redo that whole infrastructure between where ours ends and ours begins. Um, it's actually I'm talking about, right? Because even the, well, they just did it a couple months ago, that new one, they put asphalt down, but then that section where the trucks will pull in and out, yeah, yeah, it's just all broken up. I'm surprised they didn't lay some asphalt at the time they were doing on the other side. No, that's right. Um, I, I don't know. They're impossible to work with. We get no notice when they show up. Uh, they just tell us we're closing the road next week. The county has the same issue with them uh, throughout the whole Northumberland County. They have the same issue at every crossing. So, uh, but that is part of a larger project. Will that happen this year? I have my doubts given this is the middle of August already, but it's likely something that they plan on doing next year. A little bit frustrating and not because you guys aren't doing it. It's, it's not you because they had the asphalt to do it because they took the dump truck full of the extra asphalt and dumped it beside their silver building there. And now it's just a big bound of hardened asphalt when they could have done that little section with it. Mary. Thank you, Preston. I already talked to you about uh, the problem that uh, where the, I think it's wild raspberries or something that it's coming out. So on, um, on the sidewalk, just below the tracks. The Cooley property. The other one that I know um, several people who have had trouble navigating across um, the walkway on Ontario Street across the tracks. I don't know for sure, but I think the last time that was cleaned out, a bunch of us went over there when we helped Ralph and Eugenia Bangi when they were no longer able to keep things up. Um, and it's not safe there so um i know that it's not our property that gate that goes across there but 
for for the safety of our, our pedestrians. People like Linda who ride scooters, they need that extra room to get through. Uh, people with walkers, um, young moms with strollers, all that. So is should we not do it anyways? And because I know being on council for a long time, you can argue with forever with the CN and CP and nothing gets done. But for safety's sake, I think somehow, can we get a crew in there to get that at least so the full sidewalk is available? Through you, Madam Chair, is that on, on Prince Edward and Ontario? Because there, there's some well, issues at both. Well, you know that the it, sight lines aren't great on, on Prince Edward Street, they're terrible. The other, there, I, when I come up <clears throat> Bowes Road, I'm finding more and more the growth there at the top of the street. I have to pull out. There was a lady killed there not too many years ago for probably the same reason. So that definitely needs the, all the, um, around that area, the, the brush needs to be cleaned back out. But, uh, so I would say that that's a number one concern, but, um, also for people that are pedestrians, whatever, and I mean, you know, because your your wife has accessibility problems, uh, and I'm sure Linda could vouch for it. That on Ontario Street is is narrowing. You live right up in Colleen, just down from that, and it's bad in through there. Okay, so Ontario Street was trimmed about a month ago. We went in and trimmed it. Uh, it's another spot that's been identified to do again. And then there's about 40 spots I noticed while I was walking that there's encroachment into the sidewalk that we need to trim. So um, I spoke to the manager Monday morning and uh, it was just after our conversation and uh, we're going to have staff walk every every square meter of sidewalk we have and trim back what needs to be trimmed back to That's a safe good. distance. Mm -hmm. And we have the right to trim back 18 inches uh, right. beyond the edge of our sidewalk okay. to provide a safe walking area. Now, that might be a bit much in some spots because people have some nice cedar trees and stuff to grow out. So we'll just go straight up on those to try to keep them looking well. But there's a lot of areas that have been identified that need to be cut and trimmed back. You're right. And may I just finish that conversation? And I know Preston, um, people, when they plant on municipal property, get very angry if you're trimming. So in your defense, you know, and, and we get it all the time. You know, when they do some brushing, when Bowes Road was brushed, people were losing it. But they don't stop and think. The reason it's being brushed is for safety. So it's, it's something that needs to be communicated more. So, yeah, I'm glad that you're going to look after those things. Thanks. And through you, Madam Chair. Yeah, anything that is a major cut is, is gets a knock on the door to the property owner. Mm -hmm. And uh, last fall, when we went to go do this, uh, we put ads in the paper saying we're going to do some, you know, general sight line maintenance. Um, just be aware that we're going to be out there. We're going to be trimming trees that are encroaching on the roads and sidewalks and that sort of thing. So when we do our fall again this year, uh, we'll do the same kind of publicity uh, blitz in the paper and, and the website. Mark? I was just going to mention on Prince Edward Street, there was a municipal crew trimming back all the vines and the raspberry thorns that were coming out. I don't know if they've done the whole thing, but I saw them there yesterday trimming. And I was just gonna mention, I had a concern come forward for Mead Street South for what you just mentioned, hedges protruding out and causing sight line issues. Through you, Madam Chair. I took uh, three pictures on Mead Street that we got to trim back. Uh, two spots are really bad, you're right, yep. Any other comments or questions or? Oh, Mark. Yeah, just while Preston's still here, just on the sidewalk. And I know they're probably gonna do it. Remember I had mentioned last year, they're still gonna do the repairs. I know there's some spots for pets. It's those two right in between the post office and CIBC where somebody stomped down with their feet. Uh, Three, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, that those are gonna be repaired as well as the one in front of Casey Lane that I think it has half a blueprint in it or, or a large paw print. Uh, both of those are going to be done. I think there might even be a third spot somewhere on Main. I just can't recall it. And I think the only other sidewalk 
thing um, we had talked about last time was that walkway between post office and CIBC that's uneven, that's not municipal property, but we hear lots and lots of comments about it. And I was going to write a letter to both CIBC and post office, and I have not done that yet. So it's on my to-do list. So I will do that. <laughs> I don't know if will it make any difference, but at least we can show that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an issue that's come to us many, many times. Um, yeah. Mark's got his hand up again. Well, Preston's here. I just want to clarify something on a personal front because I messaged him the other day asking about, because there's the tree planting program for the municipality and one of the staff members had marked out where the possible tree could go. And then the other day there were people there spray painting all over. So I messaged Preston just because I've been married long enough to know. I knew my wife would come home and she did. She said, what the, why are you spray painting the lawn? Because there was like, blue, yellow, orange arrows all over. So that was just so I could say, no, no, I didn't do it. <laughs> you should have seen the guys on Sanford when they dug up my flower bed without telling me. <laughs> Cause yeah, municipal property, but it's like, ah, we would have known I would have moved my plants. Anyways, that's, that's another point. Um, all right, any other? questions or comments. Thank you so much for this update. It's awesome to actually see it on paper and have a visual of the plan for sidewalks. So we really appreciate that. Mary? And kudos to, to everybody that has worked so hard because Sandy, I guess you and I are the longest. Oh yeah. But how many years have we been screaming about sidewalks and now and now we're getting a lot of them done, so that's good. I'm just gonna let you know, I'm gonna attach that map to the uh, minutes or so that it'll be in the in the record there. Um, and I was hoping maybe we could just get a, a motion that the committee receive the report from the Director of Public Works and Infrastructure. Just before, oh. excuse me. Just Linda, before yeah, go you, ahead. Yeah, just before you do that, Last meeting, we wanted to know um, the sidewalk on Thomas Thomas Crescent, and it has been done, and it looks like it's been very well done. And thank you for that. Uh, it wasn't I didn't notice it covered on the map. That's why I'm adding that. And um, so uh, that was done, and and nobody should complain about that sidewalk again because it was done very, very well done. Thank you. And I'm, I'd am motion to, to accept Preston's uh, talk tell, telling us okay. about stuff. I might, I might put that on hold for a sec because Preston okay. was going to talk and Mark's got his hand up too. Okay. Before Sorry. we close it off. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, just to clarify Thompson and that whole development. Uh, the sidewalk repairs were the responsibility of the developer because it's part of his assumption process. The tack plates, um, I think he's going to pay for the bulk of them, but some of them might be our fault because um, that subdivision is so old and dated that the new protocols and the new standards for sidewalks weren't in place. So I think we have to pay for a couple of those. But overall, the developers covered that whole area. He just happened to use our same contractor while they're here to get the work done because he had a lot of those repairs done last year and the year before, and he had to redo them this year because of just poor workmanship. Well, Preston was here. I was just gonna echo what Councillor Tadman said. I think the contractor the last couple of years has done a great job on doing the sidewalks and putting this out, like you said, is great, but maybe you could even speak to it because we've talked to it. No matter how great a job we're doing, there's still some people that come up and say, how come you haven't done this sidewalk or that sidewalk when you can see that they visibly need it? But it's because, because we've talked about it, there might be something next year that's going to be happening under the road. So you don't want to repair the sidewalk just to tear it up the following year. So I think it's important for residents to know they're not being ignored. Their sidewalk, yes, is bad, but it's scheduled for infrastructure work underneath. So you're not going to do it twice. I think. Uh, three, Madam Chair, Th that's correct, um, Mark. But uh, a lot of it is to just trying to balance funds and try to keep it affordable over multiple years. Uh, and then once we're caught up on our accessibility needs, then we can focus um, 
use or, or money towards you know, the capital construction of just redoing the lengths just to make them wider and, and, and better rather than accessibility means. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Linda will accept your motion to accept Preston's report. Do we have a seconder for that? Oh, Paul, I saw your hand first. All in favor? All righty. Thank you very much. You're welcome to stay. <laughs> um, what is next on here? We have library update from Heather. I can promise you that this won't be near as long as Preston's but I'm learning a whole lot about sidewalks. Holy smokes. <laughs> uh, just to let you know that now that the library is open to the public, we're slowly bringing some furniture back into our space. And it's a great time for us to sort of reimagine our space uh, in many respects. Um, I'm looking at signage. I, I have some new signage coming that I thought would, just wasn't um, clear enough, moving things down to more to eye level. Uh, I wonder if a, a member of the committee would be willing to come and walk through our Brighton branch just to, um, to give me some feedback on, on possibilities. I think this is a perfect time to do it. And I would welcome that opportunity. I continue to be amazed by how much people don't consider accessibility and how much uh, people just don't know accessibility about accessibility. They, you know, people say, well, you can just put chairs here, not realizing that, well, not everybody can get through that space. You know, they're only considering what they are able to do. Uh, in terms of Codrington, we've got 400 square feet that's open to the public. It's very cramped, but we're doing what we can to remove some of the larger pieces of furniture that weren't serving, they weren't serving us and they weren't serving the public. So we're making it a little bit more open. Uh, we can only do so much with that um, property, but we're doing what we can. Uh, that's pretty much all the update I have. So I'm willing to hear some feedback about uh, a member that would be able to come in and do a walkthrough. Uh. Heather, it's Linda. I could come by with my scooter if you would like. That would be wonderful. Go around and see. Because before the pandemic, you had it set out pretty well. Okay, good. Okay, I will do that. That's great. Not next week. I'm on holidays. Okay, uh, I'll leave it a week. Okay, thanks, okay. Linda. Thank you, Linda, for doing that. Sandy's got her hand up. Okay. Do you need more than one? Sure, another perspective would be helpful as well. Okay, I can do that too, but again, in two weeks. Sure, thank you. And I think, I know after our last meeting, we had that motion um, about um, appointing you or a library representative to the committee, um, but it probably hasn't gone to council yet, has it? To be approved? No, it'll be after this one. After this one, yep. okay, okay. Um, okay, all right, well, thank you. And uh, yeah, we can put that even on our agenda, even for next time, just an update for uh, the walkthrough and how that went. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next on our agenda then, oh, do we need a motion to accept a report? Okay. Um, so um, I'll put forward the motion to accept Heather's report from the library. Any seconders for that? Mary? I'll second it. Mm, okay. Okay, and all in favor? All right, so that passed. And now we'll move on. Uh, to business, uh, 7.1 is election of a vice chair. Um, Karen was our vice chair for the past couple of years and now that she is no longer on the committee, um, we need someone in that position in case um, I can't be here for a meeting. Um, so I didn't know firsthand if anyone has any interest in taking that position to start with. Um, 
unless we can just nominate people directly. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, no, I can, I can cover a meeting if you're gone, but I don't have the, the, the ideas, the energy, the, you know, the stuff that Karen could suggest it and then jump in and do it and delegate and all that. So <laughs> you know, can have half a title. Hopefully, hopefully someone else would like to try it. Mer Sound, you, you can only, you've got to be a full person, Sandy. You can only be half a person. And I'm out of there. Okay. <laughs> so since Sandy's out of there and uh, we've got some new people that I know are really anxious to, to get accessibility moved forward. So I would like to nominate Heather as the vice chair if she would accept. Uh, am I even allowed to do that? <laughs> no. That was my thought. If she's not an official part of the Met committee yet. No. And I think I'm a, an informational member. Not that I don't want to be, but I just want to, everything to be on the up and up. Uh, that, that's correct, Heather. You're right. Uh, as a, you're, you're essentially a staff rep from the library, so can't be a, okay. a chair, unfortunately. Sorry, Mary. Oh, uh, that's okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, Councillor Bateman is itching to be vice. So, uh, if he will accept, then um, we we will have our vice chair. Well, I was going to nominate Mark too because I thought you might be able to step in. <laughs> As vice chair, do I get to tell Mary what to do? No, <laughs> oh. you could try. Do you see me telling her what to do? No, I'll do that. Yeah, sure. Okay, so if there's no other uh, nominations, then you are now the vice chair by acclamation, sir. We'll clap for you. Bow, bow. You can put that on your resume. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm usually around anyways, but just in case. Um, if we move on to 7.2, hearing assistance technology for service desk. Um, I'll let Tom speak to that one. Thank you. I have to open up my email because I have to find the how this originally came to me and it's escaping me right now. Um, oh, it was basically, it was sort of a cold call. Uh, I think they are just, the, the organization was just sort of reaching out to municipalities and, and organizations that have um, a lot of public facing services. Um, because of the pandemic, um, it's been, uh, identified that the plexiglass barriers that are basically everywhere now can be a bit of a barrier to accessibility for certain people. Um, so these hearing loop technologies um, provide a, a means for better uh, communication from both sides of the glass. Um, so basically, I just included it for information and discussion. Um, if this was something you guys wanted us to look into further, that could be a recommendation uh, to council to, to look into that. Go ahead, Mark. I like the idea of a recommendation to council because it's not set to just one building every building now has that and it might also be something that with the mayor being our rep on county council that can be taken to county council because if you're going to do it there could be possible funding coming back from the county and perhaps even the province as part of that covid money that we had for all the different things i don't think this is the, i think it should go to council but we should take the approach that we might not necessarily have to pay for it all because covid this is, is a barrier that covid has presented us and there is funding for that so mary 
Thank you. Uh, even before COVID, uh, we would sometimes um, hear a voice from people in the audience of the council chambers because they couldn't hear what so-and-so was saying. So as we get older, sometimes we don't hear as well. Uh, so I think overall, I would, I would see this as a valuable to, tool, you know, but it's always good to see if we can get steal some money from the COVID fund too. So, um, but overall, we need to offer our residents um, the full benefit of being able to see and to hear and, um, you know, so I, I would think that it's a good recommendation to go before council so that we can start looking at that. Heather, do you have any feedback about library patrons? Because you guys already had screens there, didn't you, or no? No, we didn't put our screens in until last year after COVID hit. And I find that uh, we haven't had too much of an issue. It seems to be more the mask that's causing the issue for us. And what about here, Tom? Has there been feedback? Has people been saying or the staff saying they can't hear patrons that come in? Um, not, I mean, I haven't had any like sort of direct, you know, um, complaints, but I can just speak for even myself, just communicating with people um, to do, you know, explaining where to sign on a form or uh, certain things that, um, you know, you have to bait, you're almost sort of yelling yeah. at, at times. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not ideal. You know, I think that something like this would, would make communication a lot easier for people and just everybody. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah but definitely for, for those with hearing issues. Yep. Okay, so is the committee in support then of putting a motion in for uh, staff to look into uh, this as an option for, do we need to put specific spots down? Like would we say both library and front hall and sharp or um, trying well, to think of what the I've amount? What I've got here uh, is uh, just for you know starters is that the committee recommend council direct staff to investigate funding options to implement hearing assistive technology loops at public service stations. Okay. And yeah. It's just across the board. Mark. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Mark moved it. Seconders. Sandy. All in favor. Aye. All righty. Thanks for bringing that forward. Um, and then the next thing, 7.3, is 2022 Public Education and Outreach Initiatives. At our last meeting, we started talking a little bit about outlook for the next year, about projects to work on and things like that. Um, I know I wrote down my own to-do list this morning because there was a few things I didn't follow up after our last meeting. <clears throat> but I know for sure we need to talk about sort of public education ideas for May 2022. That's usually when we have our sort of public education event um, for International Day or P International Week um, for Disabilities. Um, has anyone had any ideas for that? Any brainwaves? Any thoughts? Mary, did you send me a link for a speaker? I have written in my notes you were going to send me a link for a speaker. And I don't know if I got any link. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Um, I was thinking um, things like wayfinding for uh, visual impaired. Um, And certainly in the in the public works end, the tactile plates, is that the only demarcation of a ramp that you have on the sidewalks where people are coming up to it? It's the only one that we're installing now, yes. Yes, okay. Um, in some cases, uh, if you have a sight to a seeing impairment, 
what very often happens, and especially for those um, uh, people, say, with diabetes who have had laser eye treatment for, for blood vessels in the eye, what happens is you lose your depth per perception and your peripheral vision. So things like ramps, you don't see that. You don't, you don't demarcate your eye. Your eye doesn't see that the ramp is going down or that the stairs are going down. Um, so if there's uh, a ways to, to delineate a stairway, a ramp, um, other than a tactile plate, because you're walking up to it and you don't know that there's a ramp there. Um, you know, kind of that, that kind of thing. Uh, wayfinding, for instance, where um, if you're in a building, a public building, you may not be able to visually see the signs, but you can see colors. So things like follow the green arrow, like hospitals, for instance, you know, things like that. Um, you know, just a, a, few, a few little things like that. Thank you. We used to have, well, the chair of our committee, um, Liz, Real, I only knew her, knew her as Simpson, but she was legally blind and we worked an awful lot on that years ago. But I think that as you brought that up, Paul, that maybe next year we could um, work more towards uh, people with eye impairment and hearing impairment. Uh, we could make that our, our goal for next year because as you, you brought up, Paul, there's lots of ways that um, would help people that, uh, and there's certainly, you know, they say Brighton is a senior population for the most part. Well, I know myself, I'm getting a cataract taken off the end of this month. And my peripheral vision isn't great anymore. So, you know, it's, I'm not pointing to myself, but I know that there's an awful lot of other people that I've talked to that do have that same problem. And, and as you say, people that have diabetes, could, juvenile diabetes starts when people are very young. So if everybody on the committee would be in agreement, I know that, that there's ways that Heather, because I am on the library board, there's ways that we could help those people also. Um, and I'm sure you can come up with lots of ideas too, Heather, as you you know get thinking about it. So. If, if the rest of the uh, um, committee wanted to look at doing something like that, I, I think there's all kinds of possibilities. And I just wanna say to remind everybody that the digital archives did a wonderful job with um, because of COVID. And I think there was a lot of good teaching out of that. So um, maybe next year we can take on this and really expand it to, to help a lot of people. And you bring the expertise from the young people, from the ones you work with too. So, but there's so many avenues that I think that we can look at. So, thank you, Paul, for bringing that up. Yeah, that is a good idea. And even linking with CNIB or um, you know some of those agencies to see about doing whether a public awareness campaign or having a speaker come in um, that we could also, you know, broadcast on, on YouTube um, about, yeah, probably experiences with that or how to navigate the community better visually. So, yeah, I think if everyone's in support, then maybe we'll put that as our vision for next spring for, um, for a project towards that. Okay. Okay. Tom? Just one thing to add to that too, um, just for maybe for next meeting, um, I was talking to um, manager of communications and economic de development, uh, Ben Hagerman. Um, and right now we've got uh, a great resource in um, an assistant that's working with him. Um, just an amazing idea generator, like uh, especially for public outreach type stuff, PR, um, and just general ideas. Uh, so I was thinking, you know, if, if, if you guys have that 
that solid idea, like this is the approach you want to take, we could maybe have her come as a uh, delegation or, or at least participate at the next meeting to, you know, bring those ideas into fruition of how we can actually, uh, you know, come up with a plan for that. That sounds like a good idea. Have a new, I, I totally new ID pe person to talk to us, to give us some oomph. Thank you. I totally agree with you, Tom. She has been amazing help, but when does she leave? Um, it sounds like the contract is extended. So I think uh, the oh, fall is, is covered. So that was part of the reason too, is kind of like, this is a good, we should take advantage of this resource while we can. Yeah, yeah. let's move on it because she does have some great ideas. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Um, what else did I have written down for outreach from last time? Did it, did it, did you, um, we talked about the compliance report that Tom is working on that you started over the summer. It still is summer, so you're working on it. Um, And I think the other thing we had talked about um, was about library, um, having an actual accessibility plan for the library. And then we'll get to you after. Yes, we did mention that. Um, do we want to talk about that today or defer that to another time? Uh, I think we can defer that to another time. I think Mary's taking over that, aren't you, Mary? I vote Mary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, I think it makes sense to have it after, uh, put a plan in place or begin the work on it after um, the two people have come and done the walkthrough with me. Yep, okay, perfect. I'm just, I'm trying to cross off everything on the list so I'm not forgetting things. Preston, you had your hand up. Yes, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to speak on, you know, public outreach and, and engagement, is there any way to work with the local business groups downtown? Because so few businesses are actually accessible uh, by either with uh, automated doors, ramps, widths of doors. Because um, I'm thinking there's the post office, there's Rexall, Sobeys. No frills, those kind of places. Everything else is is pretty much out of reach for anybody with barriers of mobility. And uh, I just thought maybe there's a way to engage the business community to understand that that need is out there. Um, on my to do list, because I didn't do it from our last meeting, is we actually developed a checklist, um, an accessibility checklist that a business or organization can take and go through their own site and do their own site review. Um, and so I'm going to approach the DBIA with that checklist to see if there's anyone willing to go through that process with me. Um, I think Mark's name was on that too. <laughs> it it was from a couple meetings ago, but I, I don't mind doing it on my own, but that might at least open that door to having those discussion with businesses to have them look at options for those sorts of things. I know Dragonfly did put in a button and they had a ramp as well, but there is quite a few places that don't have that set up. So, so to me, that might be a bit of a, of a way to get that foot in the door of opening that conversation with them. Oh, sorry, you have your hand up. I didn't see that. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Um, this goes, falls right in line. And thanks to Sandy um, for forwarding uh, contact to, I think they're called Trendval. Um, they did a delegation to your husband's uh, committee. Um, I think it's the Quinty Economic Development. Um, so I did touch base with the, the person from that organization and, uh, it falls right in line with this. They're, they're, they're focused on, um, helping businesses do accessibility type things and, and come into, uh, you know, just improve their, their services basically through accessibility. 
um, and they are working on a, a few uh, materials for to you know shop out to to businesses that there's funding available. Here's how to get the funding. Here's your steps you need to take. Um, and I guess they're working on a video as well as a bunch of other materials. So she's going to be forwarding me those and I'll probably be giving these to the committee at the next, next meeting. And then also to the economic development committee so they can push that out. And then you could also take that to the DBIA. So it kind of brings in, it's like $10,000 grants that are um, for small businesses. Um, and there's like tons available. I guess she, she was telling me member organizations uh, received about 200,000 total last year in, in uh, the Quinty area. So $10,000 grants, 20. Yeah. That'd be great. Cause I think that's one of the biggest barriers for a business is the cost to purchase items. Um, yeah. Sandy. If we have her come in, Tom, would that be something that would help all of us too? Um, yeah, she seemed to be, like I asked that at first and she seemed to kind of steer me toward just using the materials that they're, they're creating, but I can definitely, when she reaches out, I'll, I'll ask her if she's willing to, to do that again. It sounds like such a good resource. It caught me off guard there, but when Jim told me about it, I thought, holy smokes, you know what? It covers a lot of our problems right there. Yeah. Yeah. Good point, Preston. That's really good. I'd like to speak um go ahead linda the the um cer new ceramics store i believe has um uh, ramps to put out for people coming in and out of their store because that's an extra big step to go into that store that's just open recently and the uh dollar store has a ramp now the ramp's been there since i believe the furniture store was there but it's still, as long as uh, somebody can open the door for you, you can use a ramp. I think the ramps are a good idea for some locations. It may not suit every location, but I think it would be something that store owners should look into, um, depending on the size of the store, of course. Even a ramp is, can, can be good for walking as well. Not, not that the ramps are just for like someone with a scooter like me. Um, just, just, okay, to go off that subject, sorry, several people have said to me, they've gone to the beach, they love the Moby mats, thank you for giving us better stability to walk to the beach, and I don't even know if they knew I was on accessibility, but they, I had several people tell me they're great, so that's going back to the Moby mats, I know it's off subject, but that, that, it, and, and I was surprised that people just out of the blue said how good they were. So good to us. Thank you. Um, just to add to the movie mats, there's been an extension. I think they put in another piece or two. So the movie mats now go almost down to the water. Sandy, line. can you pull your thing? I think the problem is, is okay. Uh, try that. The Thank you. Mats, Linda, they, I think they've added two more extensions, so you can go almost straight down to the waterfront now. That's what I was told, and I was surprised at that. Yeah, but, uh, I have not heard anything about it, but I was down, I go there regularly, so you can almost go to the waterfront, so um, it, it's great. Great. We worked really hard um, in the past to encourage the downtown people um, to become accessible or as accessible as they can because some people rent the places and it, the owners don't want to put that kind of money in. But we did have a ramp that we loaned. Where did, whatever happened to it? Sorry. It's tucked away in um, your building, I think, in one of the back offices in the corner. I, I believe it's, it's stored at Sharp. Yeah. Yeah, you're correct. There, yes. is, there is about a, a six foot folding ramp, ramp. aluminum ramp down. Yeah. You're right. It was in our old filing room. Yeah. And I believe it's been moved upstairs. Oh, wow. That's oh. a <laughs> but, yeah, I love no, that. It's down in our building around. for sure. 
I loved that thing all around Main Street, going store to store, yeah. trying to make it look like it was a piece of cake. You know, scrawny little me with my with my my crutches and everything. And I went into all the stores and you know sold the whole thing. Not that we sell it, but you know, suggesting that this would be a great thing or buy one ramp and share it between the stores or whatever. That was five years ago. Oh, at least. Oh, yes. Maybe ten. I, yeah, we worked our buns off trying to promote this to the stores. They yeah. thought it was a great idea, but nothing happened. So, uh, Linda again. I got to use the ramp at uh, Sharp Street once because I couldn't turn around in the hallway back by the offices. So they opened the back door and there was a little lip and they put the um, the ramp down and I got to leave the building out of the back door. So that was, yes, quite a few years ago. But uh, the person was new there in the office where it was stored. So he didn't even know he had it in his office. I asked him, I asked them about it. They looked around the building, they looked around the offices and it was at a logical place. It was by the back door where somebody could have access to that ramp to get out the back door. I thought I thought it was quite unique that they were able to do that for me, other than me have a problem getting, maybe having to, because I couldn't get into the doors in the offices to turn around and my backing up skills are not very good. So that was my situation, thank you. Through Madam Chair, just as a broader thought, perhaps the approach should be taken from the municipal standpoint and perhaps there's alterations we can do to sidewalks in different locations to eliminate the need for a ramp into stores but still provide access for those with mobility. Now it's in some spots to be part of a larger street redesign because of the width of sidewalks on the north side, but uh, perhaps that's an approach we should take over the next couple of years to be design ready to improve sidewalks that way to eliminate the need for people to have to call ahead and tell I'm coming and because you know that's kind of embarrassing. Um, Knock because, on the door trying to get someone to right. open the door for you, right? In, in my wife's experience, that too, where she just won't do that because she doesn't want to be, you know, an inconvenience to anybody. So um, she likes to be independent. So perhaps that's what we should do is, is approach it from the municipal side with the landowners or property owners to maybe improve access that way. Uh, exactly the same way it's uh, done in front of the bank, where it's the Royal Bank, where it's all kind of humped up a little bit. Um, so it might change some parking access. We might have to put up the odd rail where these spots are so people don't have that large step onto the street. But perhaps that's the approach that might work to actually get that to move forward in the downtown core. No, I agree. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, but looking at it from a different way um, instead of each individual business, even along the north side, because that whole north side, it's all, it's pretty high, all of the steps to go into all those buildings. Um, is there anything else for public education or outreach initiatives or things for the next year that we haven't talked about yet? Sandy? I have a question because um, I came up the ramp today to come in and I'm supposed to come in the door downstairs, but there's stairs there, right? Yeah, so apologize for that. Um, I, we're, I guess there, there's no um, actually standard procedure for accessibility in our, in our emergency uh, uh, customer service setup now. Um, so like we have like, you know, sort of general, general understanding that the front doors would be used for anyone that needs, uh, to enter the building in an accessible manner and come through, uh, go into use the elevator from there and then in, um, so have to, it requires some a staff member to meet at the front door, come in elevator, meet them at the elevator and then bring them in. Um, I know it's a bit convoluted, but the service desk uh, at, at the ramp 
is the obviously the finance uh, main service area, and there's a, a genuine concern there about security of the, the, the money and all that kind of stuff for people entering directly behind that desk. Um, so nothing against people. It's not, not saying that you're untrustworthy. It's just that it's, you know, not a best practice to let people in behind the cash kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, so that's a communication thing that we just need to push out a little bit more. And, and uh, so anyone that needs to enter the building uh, an accessible way where we're going to direct them to uh, come in through the front entrance from now on. But yeah, for sure. And yeah, I guess signage for that as well would be good, especially if the library is closed, but someone's still coming into the building that they're not stuck in the foyer without, yeah, not being, because then they have to walk around <clears throat> here to get help to walk around back down there. Exactly. Which it's not an ideal situation no. in any way you look at it because um, you don't want to make someone have to walk all the way around the whole entire building or whatever. Right. But um, so it's just a communication thing that we need to, we need to get better at. Sorry. I just have an, a, an odd thought on that. Um, Anybody with accessible needs and has accessible parking needs has to park across the street in the municipal lot in either one of those first two spots. What are this group's thoughts of uh, designating the two south spots on the wall over here where the fire department is as accessible spots so that somebody can, I, I just don't recall seeing a sign on the wall, they could be. I know the two over here are at the ramp because those two should be too, because people could unload and come around without any barriers to get through the front power doors. Okay, I'll check that and, and okay. So through, through the chair, would that mean actually like uh, painting on the, on the ground as well, that, like the market? Yes, they'd have to be signed and then painted on the ground as well, which we can all do because we're currently doing that program right now. Okay. You talked about signage and messaging. That's a good place to have the sign to have a sign there to indicate. And as Paul was talking, you know, not everybody sees peripherally or whatever, you know, that, that some kind of an arrow to show them where they go in and take the elevator up and whatever. Because that is, that is horrible coming around asking somebody when they come to the front door, I, I felt embarrassed having to tell some older people when I was uh, volunteering at the outside of the library. I'm sorry, but I, you know, you can't go through here to the elevator because of COVID, you have to go all the way around there to the side. And then, you know, I, and I know it was just during COVID, but um, they, it takes a lot of effort for some people to even to get to the front doors. Then I'm, then we have to tell them, oh, sorry, but now you've got to go all the way around there. Well, you know, you could see the frustration and because, you know, they're exhausted just getting to there. So I think we need some signage and, and those two parking spots there are perfect to come up the ramp. Okay. Um, all right, we will move on then from 7.3 if there's no other comments there. And I think we've already talked about a few 8.1 accessibility concerns from the public. Is there anything else under that area that needs to be brought up and put in the minutes? Mark's got his hand up. Uh, just a follow up. Uh, I can't remember the date we talked about it. Mary, maybe you'll remember. It might even predate you, Tom. We talked about having a spot for Quinty Access to pick up on the south side of the arena. And it's that spot next to the two handicapped spots. The last we heard from the director was we were waiting for signage. And there's no signage there yet. I don't know if Quinty Access is still using that parking lot, but they should have a designated parking spot. And we thought that was the best based on, but there's nothing there to indicate that. And if we can get it sooner than later because we're not far before the arena is going to be hopping again unless COVID goes quickly south. It's going to be busier than it was last year. 
because on the same note, from accessibility and safety standpoint, the whole front of that arena to myself, I personally think it's a hazard because there's not a whole lot of, when you look at the parking spots facing north, there's only a small area to drive through there and then you're right on top of the sidewalk to the arena and then we've got a food stand there that makes it even more dangerous. And along that same note, if we're looking at that, could this committee look at organizing a tour of the arena so that we can address some of the concerns that constantly came up before with the washrooms and this and that. Not saying they don't see it, but similar to what the CAO at the library wanted, if we sent people in there, they might see something that the people that are there every day don't see that are barriers, whether it be lighting, because you, you frequent the arena as well, and the handicap or the accessibility washrooms are on the other side. Sometimes those lights are turned off, and there's no signage really to indicate there. There's one above the old washroom door, but if you're not used to being at the arena like we are, you're not going to look up there to have some of an arrow pointing over there, and then it's completely dark. I just think it'd be good to take a tour so people from this group can identify stuff and put recommendations forward. Because if everything goes as planned with the province, you're going to be coming out of stage three sooner than later. So that place is going to be gearing up. The ice is going in soon, so I'd rather get on it before it's too late. And I guess the thought is, yeah, what stage is it, in? is it in? Is it going to be the same as last year where it was just in, no use of the bathrooms, get out the other door, <laughs> right? That'll be up to the province. Plus, even if the province says you can do more, they'll have to march to the drum of the OMHA and Hockey Canada, but it will still be more robust than it was last year because last year it was fairly regimental. And then we got shut down, even though we were regimental. I think there's still going to be a lot of protocols in place a little looser than it was last year, but I think we need to identify some of those issues because Mary can attest, I don't know the name of the family of the one child that went down there all the time in the chair. Like there is barriers to people being there and it's not knocking anybody that's working there. Just like when you're at your own home, you don't see stuff that somebody else, if they walk right in would see. When you don't see that cobweb up in the corner, so to speak, like you, it just becomes part of the, I think it'd be good for somebody to take a tour and even somebody from another department that's not used to being in there would see something that the others don't see. Well, and I'd be totally willing to come in and do that on behalf of the committee too. Once, once we know what the opening is, um, we could do that with yourself and me and, and even Jim Miller, just to do a walk through to talk about some issues that might come about and anyone else that would want to join. And the community center side too, because I don't know if some of you might've noticed this, like with the community center, you've got the two sets of double doors in between the two arenas. But if you're in any kind of a mobility scooter, if it's a certain width, you're not getting through those doors because that middle column mm -hmm. can be removed, but it's not, it was never put in to be easily removed because it's screwed into the ground. So that's something that, you know, somebody could look at that has the, the knowledge on how to come up with a better system that, so that could be quickly removed. So that's not, find somebody with a power drill and go do it because our goal, once COVID is lifted, that community center should be, you know, utilized. That's why it was built, but you want to make sure that everybody can access it. We're we'll having to be centered out to say, okay, I can't get in there. Mark, I run through those doors with the partition uh, and go through those doors. They're wide enough for me to get through with my scooter because I've gone in there and we used to have our meetings in there. Uh, the one thing that's a problem is someone has to open the door for you to get in there. The door isn't propped open because there's no button to get in those doors. So that was more my concern that you can't do it independently, but definitely I can get in those doors. And, um, but you know, you're right. Anybody looking around have an idea is a good good thing to happen. Thank you. Uh, and that's a good point because we mentioned automatic doors in the downtown area and we have automatic doors on every aspect of King Edward Park Arena except for the newly built community center. Well, the newest built, it's not new new now, but it was the newest addition to that. And it's still the doors you have to pry open and put a little wooden wedge in there to keep them open. So that might be something you look at where it's hit a button and they automatically open.
And then your first point, Mark, with um, the Quinney Access parking, is that a waiting on signage from Quinney Access to go there, or is that awaiting something from staff to get set up? I would say it's probably best to reach out to the director of parks and rec because I, he said he was waiting for signage, so I don't know if that okay. meant he was getting it or Quinney Access was getting it. Mary? There was a, yeah, Quinney Access is bringing the signs, but it'll be up to Jim and whoever he gets to put them up because uh, we're in no other committees allowed to attach anything to you know, municipal property without the without staff's direction. So um, whoever Jim gets. But further to that, when you mentioned- it's Mary, before you move on, do we actually have the signs then or are we still well, waiting signs? I'm just, I'm trying to figure out where the- Yes, well, the last uh, meeting I was at, at Quinney Access, which now is called Tr Quinney Transit. Shelley said they were in a back order, but they, she thought within last, that week. So they may very well be sitting at to Jim's office or something, I don't know. But she said that, because um, I kept bringing it up, where's the sign, where the signs? And she said they were in back order, but you're supposed to be in this week. So I'll ask Shelley if they were delivered to Brighton. Uh, the other thing that I have always been kind of shocked in the fact that Years ago, for a long time, we always had a safety, health and safety committee. We don't seem to have that anymore. And it was always uh, with the fire chief, uh, somebody from public works, not necessarily, because then there weren't directors then, but whoever had manager, whatever you wanted to call them at the time. But, and I remember always being on those committees and each person, as you walk through everything that the municipality owned, somebody would always find something else that was an issue, whether it was a handrail that you'd get your hand caught because it wasn't far enough from the wall or a step that wasn't built. You know, there's a certain level for each step and it was a tripping hazard or any number of things. Um, and we would do that at least once a month, I think. And then other people would bring things forward to say I see that as a as a, a problem or or needs correction or whatever I don't know whatever happened to why we don't have that so I'm glad that at least you've offered and you'll go with whoever to do the arena but uh, and Linda and you're going to do the library uh, but you know there's public works there's there's all kinds of little buildings we have in, at the health center and whatever. So uh, maybe this is a good start, but I think we should bring back the health and safety. So I don't know how we go about that. Through you, Madam Chair, the health and safety committee still exists. Every month they do building inspections. It's but a nobody different building. on council is on it, right? No, nobody on council is. And Anymore. I don't think any health and safety committee is set up like that now because it's mandated by the green book, uh, what you have to have on those committees. But yeah, they do a monthly inspection staff go around and they walk through each building. Okay. Um, I think in, over the course of the year, they cover every building that they do inspections from, and then they note issues with exit signs or door handles or steps or that sort of thing. But, but there's never a report that even comes to council that I've ever noticed. No, no, it's all just done internally and fixed and repaired. And there's certain time frames for different issues that you have to have rectified by. Uh, the larger capital projects would, would come to council. That's not just a simple repair. Um, like for instance, it was brought to our attention that the YMCA needs a couple of doors uh, automated and widened. So we've identified that. We got approval from the CAO to go ahead and do that work so that we can get that done rather than waiting till you know budget 2022 uh, for any of that kind of work. So that'll be happening in the next month or so. With the... Uh why door the doors are quite adequate i was actually there yesterday but the but if you widen them it would make it easier for me to get in if the button coming in the first door i can touch the button on the outside the pad to get in but the button for the second door to get in is so far away 
I can't get off my scooter, push the button, get back on my scooter and get through the door in time. I have to depend on somebody coming in or coming out of that door. The placement of the button is the problem at that door, just for your information. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, just to clarify the YMCA. So there's three interior doors that we have to repair and upgrade inside the Y. And I've, identi I've identified to the manager of operations to do a capital project for next year to change out those sliding doors on the front of the medical building because they're probably 30 plus years old now and, and they're leak and they're, they're kind of a jarred. So we want to redo that whole front door system. So the buttons would obviously be upgraded at that same time to be in a more suitable location and then have better doors that are wider, work better and, and uh, seal mm -hmm. a little better too for some energy efficiency. S sliding doors would be wonderful. The way they are now, are they they're just the regular push the button, the door opens, you can go in. So sliding doors would be wonderful. That sounds great idea. Thank you. Mark, you had your hand up there a little bit ago. I was just going to speak to the health and safety thing, but Preston touched on it because that's legislatively mandated. Touring the arena, that's more to see things that aren't accessible for people. And for the health and safety, I, I have quite a background in that myself. I know you have to have a certified manager. You have to be certified in occupational health and safety and you have to have a certified non-manager. So it wouldn't be just directors and managers. You, you must have some of your staff workers on there as well. Uh, yeah, there's currently three staff members yeah. on, on our yeah. committee. Yeah, and the minutes might not come before council, but they can be requested. They, even the ministry can come in and if they're not up to snuff, not to scare anybody if they're not up to snuff, but they have to see that you have been doing them and they have to see that you've had timely follow-up and they'll even classify the risks. And if you haven't fixed them, yeah, you don't want to mess with those people. Can I just make a comment? Oh, yep, go ahead. I just wanted to let uh, the committee know, Mary, especially that uh, the library actually has a rep on the joint health and safety committee. So those are monthly reports that Greg does at both branches. And if anything is not up to snuff, then it goes to me and it goes to the committee. All right, I'm, yeah, I'm watching the time. <laughs> um, I don't think, uh, was there any other correspondence? Tom, no, okay. So next meeting date. Um, always the second Friday. I had September 10th. So September yeah. 10th. Yep. Well, I'm at 10 o'clock. Everyone okay with that? Yes. Next appointment, next appointment meeting. 10 o'clock. Date. All right. Um, as far as we know, it will be here. Tom will keep us updated of changing. We'll aim for the same uh, approach where to people's preference for mm -hmm. uh, attendance and uh, here and Zoom. All right. Anyone like to adjourn then our meeting for today? Mary always likes to adjourn. Uh, I'll second it. That. Linda second. Um, and all in favor? All right. Thank you all so much for coming. Nice to see some of you and see you guys digitally up there on the screen. And I uh, hope you all have a good month.